All right, good afternoon. So let's go ahead and start for today. Uh, now again, now would be a good time to uh, talk about all the things, the emails that were sent out previously and uh, to take a look at the week ahead. Uh, and a very cold week, I can assure you. So if the weather forecast is to be believed, uh, we are looking at record cold temperatures uh, coming up this week. Uh, so Saturday, I believe starting 6 p.m. So this evening onwards till uh, Monday evening, actually, we are under a winter weather advisory as most of you must have heard. And uh, so we're expecting anywhere from four to seven inches of snow, if not more, and also record breaking cold temperatures as I was mentioning. So please stay careful. Uh, if you have to venture outside, first of all, try not to plan anything around this time. Uh, but if you do, then stay safe and uh, most importantly, stay hydrated. I think I mentioned it before as well, because a lot of people are under the impression that, well, hot temperatures, summer months, you have to stay hydrated because uh, it's so hot. Uh, but much fewer people realize that uh, the cold is actually even more dehydrating than hot temperatures, okay? So this dry cold air, it tends to dehydrate you faster. Therefore, the importance of hydration cannot be overemphasized. So make sure you're uh, fully loaded with fluids. Pure water, again, is the best uh, hydrant, right? Uh, or any other non-sugary, non-cream beverages. So black coffee, black tea, green tea, herbal teas, all those kinds of things. Uh, anything that is minus the sugar um, and creamer. And uh, stay away from like energy drinks, like Red Bull and Monster and all those. Uh, not only do they have oodles of sugar, but also uh, caffeine. Uh, and none of those would do your body any favors in the long run, okay? So try to stay away from sugary carbonated drinks. Uh, they tend to dehydrate you more than hydration. Uh, same with alcohol drinkers, right? That's what alcohol does too. It cuts out the secretion of ADH, which of course, hopefully we all know by now is an antidiuretic hormone. Uh, which conserves water in the body. Alcohol cuts it out. Therefore, you end up urinating more, and that's what gives you that bad hangover uh, after a night of drinking, okay? So, yes, remember to dress warmly and uh, hydrate yourselves. Okay, what else? Uh, so today you will be taking your lecture exam, uh, 3 to 4 p.m., and the results will be on display uh, an hour after uh, the time the deadline is approached, so 5 p.m. onwards. You can check your responses on Connect at that time. Um, and the format of the exam is exactly the same as I mentioned in my study guide. Um, I'm already working on your forthcoming lab and lecture exam study guides. As soon as I'm done, I will be sharing those with you as well. So please make sure you keep checking your emails as always. And I did send out your work that is due for this week on unit 17, which is uh, the heart, again, cardiovascular system. And tonight, hopefully, uh, you would have sent me your work from previous week as well. That was on chapter uh, 18, that was blood. So I will be putting in the grades, updating everything hopefully tomorrow, okay? All right, what else? Yes, I think that would be all. If you have any questions, any feedback, suggestions that you might have, feel free to email me. Uh, so today we are sticking to the schedule as always, and we are going to cover half of chapter 19, which is the heart. And so that means we will go over the first 77 slides here, okay? So let's go ahead without further delay and uh, talk about uh, one of the most vital organs in the human body, which is the heart itself, right? And so uh, speaking of which, uh, the heart basically is uh, the chief pumping organ, right? Uh, it's a ball of muscle about the size of your left fist. Most people know that, right? So this is roughly the size of your heart and it is made up of four chambers or four compartments, uh, a right atrium and a left atrium. That would be the upper story of the heart and then a right ventricle and left ventricle, which is the lower story. And then uh, both of these levels are connected to each other by means of uh, certain valves, which we will be discussing today, hopefully, okay? So uh, not all creatures share this four chambered heart configuration. For example, if you are a fish, you only have two chambers, right? Um, Reptiles have uh, three, with the exception of crocodiles. Crocodilians actually have a four-chambered heart. Uh, but when you get up to birds and mammals, 
you get to this uh, four-chambered heart. Um, so what is the need for div dividing the heart into these four different uh, cavities and having this uh, strict distinction between all of them? Well, because you want to keep your good blood, which means your oxygenated fresh blood away and keep it from mixing with your so-called bad blood, which is your deoxygenated uh, venous blood, all right? So it's quite important to keep these two separated. And we'll look at why that is the case. All right, so looking here, cardiovascular system. Again, cardio stands for heart, vascular from blood vessels. So heart plus blood vessels, and you can add blood to that picture as well. Uh, that is what the cardiovascular system is made up of. The function of the heart is to provide, or the cardiovascular system rather, is to provide perfusion. And when you look at perfusion, what is that? That's the amount of blood that um, goes through a gram of your tissue uh, per minute, okay? So as you can see, the unit here for measuring perfusion is milliliters of blood, that is the volume, per minute per gram of tissue, okay? So as a general statement, the more active, physically active you are, the better your perfusion is, right? Because when you exercise, when you move about, that forces your heart to pump out blood to different parts of the body. And so the more regular that you are with your exercise regimen, uh, the more well-maintained the perfusion is, all right? So your body's in optimal working condition. If you do not exercise regularly or eat a poor diet for that matter, which is going to clog up your arteries, uh, and strain your heart, give you blood, high blood pressure, maybe diabetes in the long run, then um, you're not that, <clears throat> excuse me, well perfused. So <clears throat> any physical activity is going to put that much more strain on the heart. And so you're more likely to develop things like congestive heart failure, cardiac uh, problems, coronary artery disease, and those kinds of things. And keep in mind, heart disease is the number one killer of people, human beings all across the planet. Nothing else comes even close to it, not even coronavirus, okay, nowhere near. So cardiovascular disease, uh, or CAD, which stands for coronary artery disease, is the number one cause of mortality and morbidity uh, across the world for humans, okay? Uh, so that should be an eye-opener for us, okay? So that emphasizes how important it is to keep our bodies in full functional order. And again, goes back to diet and exercise primarily, right? Uh, and so hydration also plays into the whole thing, uh, because when you are well hydrated, your perfusion is good. Your blood is at the right consistency. It's not too viscous. It's not too less viscous either. It's just uh, at the right consistency, and that maintains your system uh, in the best possible way, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the human cardiovascular system. Okay, there's the heart. You can see it located slightly to the left of your mediastinum, which is the center of the chest. Uh, then you can look at the three different types of blood vessels. All right, so that's the vascular part of the vascular system. So the arteries, as you can see here, are these uh, muscular, very muscular pumping blood vessels. Uh, so arteries, the word itself starts with an A and Remember that A for away. So arteries always take blood away from the heart, okay? Um, then the veins, as you can see here, are less muscular uh, than the arteries. And arteries, as a general rule, also carry oxygenated blood, blood which is rich with oxygen. There are a couple of exceptions, such as your pulmonary arteries actually carry deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs, but they are still carrying blood away from the heart towards the lungs, even though this is deoxygenated blood. The other exception is, uh, the umbilical cord, all right? So when you were developing in your mother's uterus, uh, the umbilical cord had two arteries and a single umbilical vein. The two umbilical arteries actually carry deoxygenated blood uh, from the fetal heart back to the mother's bloodstream for oxygenation, while the singular umbilical vein brings in fresh oxygenated blood from the mother's bloodstream to the fetal heart. So there's a, a two uh, exceptions, right? Two exceptions to uh, arteries away uh, to the to the rule that was just mentioned. Okay, uh, then we move down to the capillaries, and the capillaries are the smallest and the most fragile of all blood vessels. Uh, they are only one cell thick. And so they are exchange vessels, okay? Their job is to allow for nutrients and oxygen to be exchanged across. Uh, 
So arteries are your pressure vessels. They carry oxygenated blood mostly under high pressure. The veins are your capacitance vessels. That's what they are called, capacitance, because they hold more blood than the arteries or the capillaries, okay? 55% of your blood by volume right now is located in your, in your veins and likely in your lower leg veins, in the calf veins, okay? So yeah, we talked about the two sides of the heart, the left and the right. Uh, as a general rule, the right side of your heart receives deoxygenated blood, venous blood uh, from the rest of the body while the left side of the heart uh, carries fresh oxygenated blood uh, to the rest of your body, okay? And so here are, we are looking at the four chambers of the heart, the two atria, which are the upper chambers, and then the two ventricles, which are uh, at the lower level. So here we are. This is the human heart, as you can see, about uh, the size of your left fist. Uh, this bluish area on the right-hand side, this is all where uh, deoxygenated blood is located at. And the reddish area on the left-hand side, that is fresh oxygenated blood, all right? Um, here is your right atrium this whole area, which is the first part of the heart that receives all of this deoxygenated blood uh, back into the organ. It comes here, okay? And then this is the right ventricle, the lower story. In between the right and the left, right atrium and the right ventricle, you have this uh, valve called the right atrioventricular valve or the right AV valve simply, or also called the tricuspid valve. Why tricuspid? Tri means three. It has three leaflets or three cusps to it, as we shall see in pictures later on, all right? And the function of this valve is to ensure that the blood only goes in one direction, from the top to the bottom, and not vice versa, okay? In other words, when the atrium contracts, the upper part, it pushes the blood down into the right ventricle, but when the right ventricle contracts, this valve closes back up, it closes up. It's a one-way valve, so the heart, uh, so the blood is prevented from going back up into the atrium with the ventricular beat, all right? Instead, uh, the blood is directed here then uh, into your pulmonary vessels. Th these are your pulmonary arteries, which are going to the lungs, okay? So this deoxygenated blood is pumped into your pulmonary arteries, which carry it to the lungs. On its way up, the blood has to come across another pair of uh, valves. And these one are called semi-lunar valves, semi-lunar, which literally means the half moon. Because if you look at the cusps, the leaflets, um, they look like the half moon shape. And since uh, they're found at the base of the uh, pulmonary vessels, the pulmonary arteries, uh, the, the, this is called the pulmonic semi-lunar valve or the pulmonary semi-lunar valve right here, okay? All right, so let's trace the... Uh, the whole direction of blood flow, all right? And this is important so that we know what blood flow circuit uh, actually we're dealing with. So on the right-hand side, okay, what happens first? All of the deoxygenated blood, blood that has given out all of its fresh oxygen to your body tissues, it ascends up to the heart by means of a blood vessel called the inferior vena cava. So uh, all of your organs and body parts below the diaphragm, again, the diaphragm is this muscle in the chest that separates your thoracic cavity, your chest from your abdomen. All right, so it's right over here um, at the base of your uh, chest, right here. That's the diaphragm, okay? So all the organs and body cavities uh, below the diaphragm uh, send their blood up through the superior, uh, inferior vena cava, okay? And all the organs and body parts above the diaphragm, including your head, neck, shoulders, upper chest area, uh, that sends all of the deoxygenated blood down by means of the superior vena cava. So this is inferior vena cava bringing blood from below the diaphragm. And here is the superior vena cava bringing deoxygenated blood uh, through uh, from the areas above the diaphragm. Both of them open up here in the right atrium, okay? But this is not all. You also see these, uh, uh, something called the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is also bringing deoxygenated blood from the heart itself. So remember, the heart is not only a pumping organ for the rest of the body, but it's also a self-pump. It also pump, pumps uh, fresh oxygenated blood to its own muscle, right, to its own cardiac muscle here. So the coronary sinus is the chief vein which brings in all of the deoxygenated blood from the heart uh, and all three of those drain here into the right atrium, the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava, and then the coronary sinus. Okay, what happens then? Uh, the atrium contracts, okay? It contracts. 
Uh, the other word for contraction is also systole, S-Y-S-T-O-L-E, systole, atrial systole, right atrial systole. So when the atrium contracts, that pushes the blood down here into the right ventricle. Uh, and to move down, this tricuspid valve right here, right, uh, has to open downwards. It's kind of like a trap door. It only opens down like a dungeon. Once you slip down into the dungeon, it closes back up and then it won't let you go back up, right? It only opens in one direction. So what prevents it from opening back up into the atrium? Uh, you see these little fiber thread-like uh, structures. These are called chordae tendine, as we shall see later on. These are rope-like um, structures made up of co uh, collagen, collagenous. Collagen is this tough protein that makes these, th these are kind of like ropes which tie down the right atrium ventricular valve uh, to the heart muscle here. And these are called papillary muscles. Papill papilla means nipple. So if you look, like, look at these muscles, they look like nipple-like shape, right? So they hold the uh, tricuspid valve down here. And when the ventricle contracts, they prevent it opening backwards so that the blood can get back into the right atrium, all right? Instead, the blood is sent here, as I mentioned. Here is another valve called the, again, pulmonic semilunar valve, which opens only in one direction, so the blood can only go up. And when the blood tries to fall back, well, these flaps close back, so they don't allow the blood to come back. It's only, again, a unidirectional valve, only in one direction, okay? And that's the function of valves. They are unidirectional. They only push blood in one direction. Okay, so where does the blood go from here on to the two pulmonary arteries? Uh, fresh, uh, this is deoxygenated blood without the oxygen, right? So what does it do in the lungs? It picks up oxygen, it turns into fresh red, crimson red, uh, oxygenated blood. And so this fresh blood comes back to the left atrium of the heart via these four pulmonary veins. These are the pulmonary veins, four of them. And even though they're veins, and veins generally carry deoxygenated blood, the pulmonary veins are bringing back oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. All right, so what happens here? The left atrium fills up with blood, then it contracts, and then it pushes down all of this blood uh, to the left ventricle. But again, before the blood can go down into the left ventricle, it has to move across this valve here. And this is called your left AV valve or left atrioventricular valve, also called mitral valve, also called bicuspid valve. Bi means two. So this one only has two flaps. This one was on the right side, you have the tricuspid valve. On the left-hand side, you have the bicuspid valve, only two valves, also called the mitral valve. So all of this fresh oxygenated blood goes down into the, into the ventricle here. Then when the left ventricle contracts, uh, this bicuspid valve closes. Again, it's a one-way valve, right? It closes back up so the blood cannot escape back into the left atrium. Instead, the blood is pushed here uh, into your aorta. And remember, the aorta is the chief artery of the body. It carries blood uh, to the rest of the body everywhere. Um, however, before getting to the aorta, it has to go through another set of valves here. Now, these ones are called your aortic semilunar valves, just like these ones were uh, pulmonic semilunar valves. The one here, since they are at the base of the aorta, they are called the aortic semilunar valves. So the blood moves from here into the aorta and to the rest of the body. And so this is the full circle, all right? Uh, and remember, this is happening at the same time. So the right and the left atria are contracting at the same time, right ventricle and left ventricle contracting at the same time. Only there is no mixing of blood, you can see. There's this uh, interventricular septum, this big thick flap of muscle, which prevents the right side from mixing with the left-hand side. All right, so these are kept uh, separate from each other. All right, so here we are looking at all of these blood vessels that we have talked about, the pulmonary trunk, which turns into the pulmonary arteries, the aorta, superior and the inferior vena cava, and then the pulmonary veins. So again, here it is, uh, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, also the coronary sinus, uh, all of them bring blood back here into the right atrium, then down to the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve, then through the pulmonic seminal valve into the pulmonary trunk, then into the left and right pulmonary arteries to the lungs, get oxygenated in the lungs, then get back to the heart by means of these four pulmonary veins, two right-sided, two left-sided pulmonary veins. They drain into the left atrium then, then from the left atrium down into the left ventricle through the bicuspid or the mitral valve, and then from the left ventricle via the aortic sem uh, aortic semilunar valve into the aorta and onwards to the rest of your body, okay?
So there you have those AV valves uh, and these semilunar valves, the two sets that we talked about, right? So here in this picture, you can see uh, that they've color coded the two types of valves. The green ones are your AV valves. This is the right uh, AV valve or the tricuspid valve. That is the left AV valve or the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve, all of them, right? So they are in green. Uh, the yellow ones are your semilunar valves. So these ones here, this is your pulmonic semilunar valve because it's guarding the entrance to the pulmonary arteries. And then this is your aortic uh, semilunar valve because this one is guarding the opening to the aorta. Okay. So pulmonary versus systemic circulation. What's the difference? Simple. Pulmonary means lungs, right? So the pulmonary circulation is talking about the circuit that goes, starts from the right side of the heart. See, this is again blue in color because this is venous blood, uh, oxygen poor, deoxygenated blood. Now remember, blood is not blue at any time, right? That's a fallacy, but it's just there to indicate that, um, that this is deoxygenated blood, right? So from the right side of the heart, it goes to the lungs. This is your pulmonic circuit again, to the lungs, picks up the fresh oxygen from the lungs. See how it's turning red? It's turning red because it's picking up fresh oxygen. And then it goes by means of the pulmonary veins back to the heart, back to the left side of the heart, right? So, so that is the pulmonic circuit from the right side of the heart to the lungs and then back to the left side, that's your pulmonic circuit. And then from the left side of the heart through the aorta to the rest of the body, that is your systemic circuit. Why systemic? Because all of the systems are sur supplied by the left side, all, the, all of the body systems, the digestive system, respiratory system, uh, reproductive system, all of them, right? So they're supplied by the systemic circuit. So pulmonic circuit in blue, systemic circuit in red is how you remember that, okay? All right, so here we are looking at a clinical picture called congestive heart failure. What happens here? Congestive heart failure is also your right-sided heart failure, okay? So let's think of, of what's gonna happen if the right side of your heart fails. Look at this picture here. This is the right, right side, right? So where was blood coming in into the right side from? The blood was coming from your inferior and your superior vena cava, right? If your right side of the heart is failing and not able to pump blood uh, with enough power and enough force to your lungs, then what happens to all of the, this blood which is pouring into the right side of your heart? It's like a backup, right? It's like a backup, there's a blockage here. So all of this blood backs away into your body systems, okay? So what happens to all of this extra blood which is backing up into your system? It makes you puffy, it makes you swell up. And that is something called systemic edema like your systems uh, swell up, right? So if someone comes with congestive heart failure to your medical practice and you are uh, trying to diagnose uh, what are some of the signs and symptoms that you would see in congestive heart failure? Uh, the patient is short of breath, right? There might or might not be chest pain, something called angina, uh, but they will be uh, fatigued, uh, pale, uh, difficulty breathing, right? and swollen up. So how do you check for edema, systemic edema? You take your thumb and you press down on the top of their foot, right? It's the feet usually that swell up. Why feet? Uh, because blood tends to pull down towards the lower extremities, right? So you take your thumb and you press down on the top of the foot uh, and keep it pressed for about 10 seconds and then remove it. If there's a dip, like a pit that forms, it's called pitting edema. If you, if you form a pit there, that means there's substantial edema, okay? And if that it takes greater than 30 seconds to fill up, that is substantial edema. A lot of fluid has leaked out into the system. So systemic edema is what you will see with your uh, right-sided heart failure, okay? Uh, and so how would you treat right-sided or heart failure in general? You need to get rid of this extra fluid. How would you get rid of this extra fluid? You give them diuretics, diuretics uh, or water pills or pee pills, right? So CHF for congestive heart failure management, you need what? You need diuretics like Lasix, right? Lasix is a commonly used one or used to be till they realized that it was causing uh, deafness like autotoxicity, tox toxic to the ears, right? Lasix or uh, spironolactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic or hydrochlorothiazide, 
the thiazide drugs. These are all good diuretics. You might also need oxygen masks, right? Because they're short of breath. Ox oxygen supplementation, right? Supplementation. Uh, you will also give them a hormone called ANP. And hopefully you remember, ANP stands for atrial natriuretic peptide. If you remember what ANP did, it made you pee more. It made you get rid of the extra fluid. So you will give this as well to people with congestive heart failure. And you will put them on a DASH diet. DASH, D-A-S-H, all right? So what does the DASH diet stand for? Uh, it stands for dietary approach to stopping hypertension or high blood pressure, okay? To stopping hypertension, DASH diet. Uh, so what is this diet? It's pretty much similar to the Mediterranean diet, okay? And what the DASH diet does is it's uh, salt restricted, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables and beans and lentils and uh, not much red meat um, and salt restricted, okay? Because salt causes high blood pressure and uh, edema, it re retains water. Okay, so now what happens? If you have left-sided heart failure, let's take a look at this picture. So if the left side of your heart is failing for whatever reason, then all of this blood is gonna backtrack where? Where was this blood coming from? Into the left side of the heart, from the lungs. So all of this blood now is gonna pool up in your lungs, right? So th this will give you pulmonary edema, which means uh, fluid accumulation, water in your lungs, right? And so what would be the signs and symptoms in these patients? Again, shortness of breath, right? Because there's fluid in the lungs, uh, and also when you examine these patients, uh, you're gonna use a stethoscope, right? So you're gonna auscultate the patients. When you take a listen to their lungs and you ask them to breathe in deeply, when they take the deep breath in, you'll hear these bubbling sounds, right? These bubbling sounds. It, it almost sounds like uh, if you take a drag on like a water pipe, like a hookah, right? Or, or that kind of thing. And so uh, this bubbling sound, um, these are something called crepitations or craps and Crackles, okay? So crackles and crepitations. If you hear these, they indicate fluid in the lungs, okay? Pulmonary edema. How would you treat someone with left-sided heart failure? Same, doesn't matter. You, they need diuretics, they might need oxygen supplementation, ANP, uh, and DASH diet, all of them, okay? And remember, uh, if you have right-sided failure or left-sided failure, this never exists in isolation. Eventually, both sides of the heart are going to fail. So you have to treat this situation regardless. All right, so questions. Define perfusion. What is it? Perfusion is the amount of blood flow to your uh, different body regions, right? Uh, how is it measured? In milligrams, actually, uh, milliliters of blood per minute per gram of tissue. Why would it be significant if the cardiovascular system failed to maintain adequate perfusion? you won't have blood flow to different parts of the body, adequate one, and you will die of uh, or have symptoms and complications of hypoxia or hypoxemia, low oxygen. What generalization can be made about all arteries? All arteries carry blood away from the heart. What generalization can be made about all veins? Veins carry blood back to the heart. Where does the right ventricle pump blood? Right ventricle pumps blood into your pulmonary vasculature, then into the pulmonary arteries and then to the lungs. Where does the left ventricle pump blood? The left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta uh, through the aortic semilunar valve. The right ventricle pumps blood into your pulmonary vessels through the pulmonic semilunar valve. What great veins deliver blood to the right atrium, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus? What great veins deliver blood to the left atrium? Uh, the four pulmonary veins, okay? Pulmonary veins. Where are AV valves located within the heart? In between the atria and the ventricles, the upper and the lower chambers. Where are semilunar valves located within the heart? In between, at the base of the great blood vessels, at the base of the pulmonary vessels, the pulmonic semilunar valve, and at the base of the aorta, the aortic semilunar valve. What path does blood follow through the heart and through the two circulations? So we know that, right? Right atrium, right ventricle to the lungs, then back to the left atrium, left ventricle to the rest of the body. Uh, identify all structures that it passes through, including each chamber, valve, and great vessel. Begin at the right atrium. This is important. So you guys uh, just trace this whole route that the blood takes, as we mentioned. Which of the great vessels is an artery and transports deoxygenated blood? We know that now. Pulmonary vasculature, pulmonary trunk. 
Which of the great vessels is a vein and transports oxygenated blood? We know that too, pulmonary veins. What are the other example other than pulmonary? Um, umbilical core, the umbilical vein and the umbilical arteries. All right, so let's take a look at the heart. It's located uh, in the center of your chest, slightly towards the left, uh, an area called the mediastinum, which literally means the middle of the chest, right? And you can think of the heart as an upside down triangle, okay, upside down triangle. So the broad base is at the top and the narrow apex is at the bottom, like it's an upside down triangle again, right? So here's the apex and here, here's the base. Um, so the apex, uh, is found in your fourth intercostal space normally, all right? In, in your fourth intercostal space. What does intercostal mean? In between your ribs. So if you count your ribs starting from your, uh, from your, let's say, here's your clavicle, your collarbone, right? Right next below it is your second rib. And then you can palpate the third rib and then the fourth rib. So, so the heartbeat is the most prominent in your left fourth intercostal space in between your fourth and fifth ribs, all right? So if you put the uh, flat palm of your hand right here, you should be able to feel the, the, the heart pumping there. And this is called PMI. The point and PMI here stands for point of maximal impulse. This is where you will feel your heart pumping most prominently, okay? Now let's say you're looking for the PMI, the, uh, the point of maximal impulse in someone's left side of the chest and you feel it not in the fourth, but in the fifth intercostal space or further down. What does that tell you? Why are you feeling the heartbeat at a lower level? So that's telling you that the heart is enlarged, something called cardiomegaly, cardiomegaly, enlarged heart, okay? What can cause your heart to become large, larger than usual? The major reason for it, in a vast majority of cases is high blood pressure, hypertension. High blood pressure simply means that there's too much uh, blood pressure that the heart has to pump against, right? Uh, your vessels, your arteries have narrowed up because of all the cholesterol and the fatty foods you've been eating and the lack of exercise or smoking. So your heart blood vessels become narrow. And so the heart is having to pump twice as hard to push blood through these narrowed out arteries. This plumbing, this, that is all clogged up. And so that causes your heart to become large. Uh, and you're also at risk for congestive heart failure now because your heart is constantly having to work so much harder than usual, okay? All right, so, uh, so here's the base, here's the apex. Uh, the much of your apex is made up of your left ventricle, the muscle of the left ventricle. And remember, the left ventricle is about seven times thicker and then stronger than your right ventricle. Why? Because the left ventricle has to pump blood to the rest of the body, all of it. It needs that much more power how far does the right ventricle have to pump it blood? Only to the lungs and back, not too far away. The lungs are right next to the heart. Um, so the left ventricle is much thicker and it forms the apex, much of the apex of the heart. Uh, the base, what's the important thing about the base of the heart at the top? Uh, these great blood vessels emerge uh, or enter from here. So the superior vena cava, you see the aortic arch, you also see the pulmonary blood vessels, they all emerge here from, from the base, as you can see, okay? So where's the heart located? Right behind the sternum, your breast bone, you can feel it. So in many cardiac surgeries, what surgeons used to do, they used to saw their way through the sternum to the heart, right? Uh, through the sternum. So you have, you basically cut your way through the sternum and get to the heart. Same with CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So you push down right here on your sternum uh, because the sternum is overlying the heart. The heart is right behind the sternum here, as you can see, okay? And here you can also see the diaphragm, uh, the skeletal muscle that separates your chest or thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So this gives you a good idea of where the heart is. So here's another cross-section of the heart that you can see. This is what you would see in a typical CT scan, right? This is a CT scan. What type of a uh, plane is this? This is a what? Uh, is it sagittal? Is it coronal? Uh, or is it... Uh, which one is superior to um, inferior, all right? So this is the cross-sectional view, cross-sectional view, superior and inferior. So you'll, you've cut the heart, uh, the chest at this level, and you're looking at it from the top. So you see the right and the left lungs on the two sides, and here's the heart, and you see the great blood vessels. You see the iota, you see the pulmonary blood vessels, the arteries, and then you see the superior vena cava here as well, okay?
So this is a transverse section, a transverse plane is what you're looking at, okay? Okay, so next up we are looking at the uh, different membranes that surround the heart and protect it, okay? So what you have on the very outside is something called the fibrous pericardium. Peri means around, cardium is the heart. So pericardium is this thick membrane made up of collagen, again, the thick fiber and fibrous tissue and protein um, that surrounds your heart, okay? So this is called the fibrous pericardium. Now, uh, the inner layer, and here you have zoomed in into those layers so you can see it even more clearly. Here's your fibrous pericardium, a lot of thick, tough collagenous tissue, right? Then just underneath, it is this layer called the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. This is the parietal layer. And the parietal layer, see it folds into it, onto itself like this, and now it's called the visceral layer. All right, it's the same membrane, only on the outside, it's called the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. Once it folds onto itself and becomes closer to the heart wall here, now it is called the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Why is it called serous? Serous means watery. So in between, in this cavity, which is called the pericardial cavity, in between your parietal and your visceral pericardium, here's the pericardial cavity. This is filled up with a fluid, serous fluid, watery fluid called uh, the peri serous pericardial fluid, okay? So all of this brown stuff here, it's fluid, serous pericardial fluid, okay? So why do you think there is fluid surrounding your heart? To prevent friction, just like you need to put water in your car and uh, motor oil, right, to prevent friction. And that's exactly what you need here. So why do you need to prevent friction? Because the heart is constantly beating, right? So it's expanding and contracting. So this causes a lot of friction with the surrounding structures. So to prevent friction damage, you have pericardial fluid here. Sometimes you can get infections of the heart, like viral infections, mumps, right? Uh, other bacterial infections, such as after like dental surgeries and dental procedures, it's common for the bacteria to infect the heart. And so then this pericardial fluid can become like milky or cloudy. It's infected, all right? Uh, if you get stabbed in the heart or close by or get shot here, then blood can start leaking into the pericardial fluid as well. And so this fluid puts a lot of pressure on the heart. It does not let the heart expand and contract during beating because there's so much fluid accumulating, squeezing on the heart, right? So then you have to uh, perform aspiration. You have to put in a needle, a chest tube, and you have to suck out the fluid from around the heart so you can relieve this pressure on the organ so it can keep beating, right? So that's exactly what we're looking at here, pericarditis. Itis means inflammation of anything, right? So pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium. This can be caused by infections, as you can see. It can be caused by radiation damage to the heart as well, like a nuclear explosion or nuclear waste exposure or something like that, all right? And so when this fluid builds up, it can lead to something called cardiac tamponade, which means that, again, the heart is squeezed all the fluid, uh, push, puts pressure on the heart and literally squeeze you to death. And uh, what tells you that this is a case of pericarditis on physical exam and medical examination is uh, you pick up a friction rub. So when you use your stethoscope to listen to the heart, uh, with each heartbeat, it, it sounds like kind of this. It, it, it's, it's a rustling sound, like a rubbing sound. So each heartbeat has this friction rub attached with it. And so that tells you that the two layers of the, there's inflammation going on, going on in the heart layers. So what is the bony structure that protects both the heart and the lungs? Your rib cage, of course. Where's the heart positioned? Uh, in your mediastinum slightly tilted to the left. How is it oriented within the thoracic cavity? The apex of the heart uh, faces leftwards uh, into your fourth intercostal space approximately. Uh, describe the three layers that cover the heart, the fibrous pericardium, the parietal layer of the serous pericardium, and the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Where is the pericardial cavity relative to these layers? The pericardial cavities are in between the parietal and the visceral serous pericardium. Okay, so let's take a look at what else is visible in a view of the heart. So you're looking at the heart from the front, the anterior view, as you can see, right? So what all do you see? Here's your right atrium, also called right auricle. This uh, connective tissue that kind of sticks out is called the right auricle. The right atrium is right here, okay? Uh, this is the right ventricle, the lower chamber. Somewhere here would be your 
tricuspid valve separating the right atrium from the right ventricle, okay? What you also see here is your right coronary artery uh, running in this groove called the coronary sulcus. This groove here is called the coronary sulcus and the right coronary artery is running here, okay? All right, and then you also see branches from the right coronary artery like the right marginal artery here. And this is also supplying your right ventricle, as you can see in the picture, the right marginal artery. Um, and then you see the great vessels, of course, the inferior vena cava here, the superior vena cava there, right? Uh, the pulmonary veins, four of them, and then the pulmonary trunk into the right and the left pulmonary arteries. You can see all of that, okay. So here is your left atrium. Here's your left ventricle, which forms your apex of the heart mostly, and see this is much thicker than the right ventricle. Uh, and so what you have here is, again, the coronary sulcus. On the left-hand side, you have the left coronary artery running here. The left coronary artery gives a branch, gives off a branch called the circumflex artery, which you can see here, right? And also the anterior interventricular artery in the anterior interventricular sulcus, okay? Now this is the most important artery as far as cardiac surgeons are concerned, the anterior interventricular artery right here, also called LAD for left anterior descending artery, all right? And also lovingly called the widow maker. It's called the widow maker, right? Why? Because more men will die, because men get more heart attacks statistically than women, more men will die and leave widows behind as a result of a blockage of this artery here, the anterior interventricular artery or the left anterior descending artery, LAD, all the, or, or the widow maker. All, all those names and terms refer to the same structure. So why do you think this is called the widow maker? What is so critical about this, this artery? See what it's supplying. It's supplying your left ventricle, your apex of the heart. And remember the left ventricle needs the most power than any other part of the heart because it has to contract to pump out blood to the rest of the body. So if you have a blockage or problem here with your anterior interventricular artery, your heart is gonna fail without any question, right? No more blood supply to your apex of the heart, to your left ventricle. You die of a circulatory failure. You go into circulatory shock, unless you shock the heart, massage the heart, CPR or something, or give it shocks, so it starts working again, okay? All right, so there's the widow maker, as you can see. Uh, and another thing that you might be noticing, see all of these are end arteries, which means if one gets blocked, there's no alternative route to bring any blood. These are all end arteries in your heart. So if there's a blockage here, there's no other route for the blood to take. Uh, so it's, these are like dead ends. So coronary arteries of the heart are like dead end arteries. So keep your heart in good shape, exercise and sleep and manage your stress and drink water and all of that because you're ticker, that's all you got. Once it stops working here, then that's it, all right, lights out. It's all the more reason why we have to be so much more particular about cardiac health. Watch what we eat and how much we exercise, okay? More people die because of heart conditions than any other, okay. All right, so then here's your heart from a posterior view from the back, as you can see, right? And so what is most visible here, again, this is your left ventricle, thick fleshy part, the right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, you see your in superior vena cava here, you see the aortic arch, uh, you see your pulmonary arteries, and these are your pulmonary veins, bringing the fresh oxygenated blood back from the lungs into your left atrium right over here, okay? You also see what? You see, the, this is the coronary sinus. This is the main vein of the heart. This vein called the coronary sinus collects deoxygenated blood from all of the heart muscles and dumps it back into the right atrium where it can get oxygenated again and then get pumped um, to the rest of the heart by means of the coronary arteries again, okay? So you, you also see the coronary sinus here. You also see part of the right coronary artery, right? The right coronary artery, which, uh, gives rise to another branch called the posterior interventricular artery. Here's the posterior interventricular artery, okay? Uh, the sister artery to the anterior interventricular artery, also called your widow maker. So here what you, they have done is they have uh, 
bisected the heart in a transverse fashion. You can see and look at the thickness of the left ventricle, compare the left ventricle wall with the right ventricle. See how much thicker the left ventricle is because it had, again has to pump blood uh, to the rest of the body, the entire body. The right ventricle only passes blood uh, only as far away as your lungs, which are right next to the heart. Okay, so the three layers of the heart, what we have done here is uh, we have cut out a piece of cardiac tissue and we are looking at the different layers that form it, okay? All right, so uh, starting from the very outside, this entire, this is called your epicardium. Epi means in front of, so this is the outermost layer, okay, the epicardium. And uh, it's basically made up of the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, the epicardium. And what makes it is uh, connective tissue, areolar uh, and adipose, which is fat. So fat and areolar connective tissue is what forms this, all this yellow stuff is fat. So it comes as, as a surprise to, to a lot of people that it's actually fat that cushions your heart, but you need fat. This is the good kind of fat, the one that covers the heart. But if you have too much of that fat, then again, it puts pressure on the heart because there's too much fat surrounding the heart, the heart cannot do his job uh, properly there, okay? And then the type of epithelium that makes the epicardium is simple squamous epithelium. Okay, then on to the second and the thickest layer. This is heart muscle, myocardium, myo means muscle. So this is your chief heart muscle. And you can see how thick it is. Uh, you, are, you can also see that the cardiac muscle is branched. You see how it's branched like a tree. And then there's a bunch of nuclei and mitochondria. Why mitochondria? Because uh, your heart is the uh, hardest working muscle in the body, cardiac muscle. It starts beating at four weeks of development. It keeps beating till the time you die, right? So that's a lot of energy that it needs. And that energy comes from all of these mitochondria that are dispersed all around. You also see these lines here. These are called intercalated discs. And the intercalated discs are only found in heart muscle, in cardiac muscle, not in smooth muscle, not in skeletal muscle, only in heart, heart muscle, cardiac muscle. So those are the intercalated discs, these lines that you see. All right, and then here is the innermost layer called the endocardium. Endo means innermost, right? Then again, it's made up of areolar connective tissue, not fat here. Uh, there was some adipose fat tissue in the epicardium, not so in your endocardium, okay? All right, so what other structures do we see in the heart? So let's take a look here, internal anatomy of the heart. So they have removed the front wall. You can see inside. First up, again, look, left ventricle is so much more thick, thicker than the right ventricle, okay? What else are you looking at? Here, here's your right atrium. This is the opening for your inferior vena cava. That is the opening for your superior vena cava. Here you have a kind of like a closed window, kind of like a depression, a pit called the fo fossa ovalis. What is this all about? When you were a fetus, this was actually an open hole called the foramen ovale. Foramen ovale, okay? Why? Because when you were a fetus, uh, your lungs were not functioning, all right? Because you were surrounded by the amniotic fluid. You could not breathe in fluid. So you were getting all of your oxygen from the mother's umbilical vein, as I mentioned. The umbilical vein was attaching to your, the umbilical vein from the mother, of course, from through the placenta and the umbilical cord was attaching directly to your inferior vena cava here. It was pumping all of the fresh oxygenated blood into your inferior vena cava uh, by a structure called ligamentum venos uh, venosum, ductus venosum, or ductus venosus, rather, which we will talk about later on. So the ductus venosus is only found in fetus, fetal life, all right? And it connects the mother's umbilical uh, vein directly to your inferior vena cava, the ductus venosus. So then this fresh oxygenated blood came to your right atrium. And from here, it passed directly to the left side of the heart. And this would be blasphemy if this were in an adult heart, okay? Because that means mixing the right and the left side, the bad blood and the good blood together. But that's not a problem when you were a fetus because the blood here was already oxygenated from your mom. So it passed directly through the fossa ovalis or through the foramen ovale into your left atrium, then to the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle directly to the aorta. But what happened when you were born? With your first breath, your lungs inflated, and that pressure closed this window for good, fortunately, thankfully. So this window closed. Now there is a permanent differentiation and demarcation between your left-sided uh, venous blood and your right-sided arterial fresh blood, okay? 
what else do we see? All right, so here's your tricuspid valve. You see the, the, there's the three cuspid, tricuspid, tri, three. One, two, three, three leaflets. And these rope-like structures made up of collagen are called chordae tendinae. And these ropes are attached to these nipple-like papillary muscles. You see them too, right? And their function, again, is to make sure that it, the, this, this valve only opens downwards. It's like a trap door, only one way. It's a cellar, go, the blood only goes down into the cellar, the dungeon. When the blood tries to go back up, this closes back. So these chordae tendinae prevent the flaps of the valve from opening back up, right? They hold the flaps right here. So it cannot open all the way back up, right here. This is what these chordae tendinae are doing. They're holding the, uh, the valve here. Okay, what else do you see? Again, this is your uh, bicuspid or the mitral valve or the left-sided valve here, right? And then you see the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscle here again, same function. So you see the pulmonic semilunar valve here. This is your pulmonary trunk, which will divide into the left and right pulmonary arteries. That is your aorta. So your aortic, here's your aortic valve, your aortic semilunar valve, which leads into the aorta and to the rest of the body. So you can see all of these landmarks inside of your heart. AV valves, again, on the left, right-hand side, tricuspid valve, on the left-hand side, bicuspid or mitral valve. And they're one way. That's their function. They are unidirectional valves. Their job is to prevent the blood from going in the opposite direction, okay? So there you go, again, same pictures. There's your, in green are the AV valves, in yellow are the semilunar valves. Look at the flaps. All of your heart valves are tricuspid, three cusps. Your, this is your right tricuspid valve. This is your aortic semilunar valve. This is your pulmonary semilunar valve. Count the leaflets, three. The only exception is your left AV valve. That's bicuspid only two leaflets, two cusps, as you can see here, right? And so here in this picture, it's showing you how this whole thing works, right? The blood only goes in one direction, from top to bottom, and not the other way around, from top to bottom, from atria to ventricles, right? Um, and how about the semilunar valves? From bottom to top, only one way. It cannot go the other way because the, then the valve closes back. It's one-way traffic uh, in the semilunar valves as well. Okay, so teenage athletes and sudden cardiac death. Now this is, I'm sure you have seen or heard of these news when some top athlete or someone, soccer player, tennis player, somebody, basketball player, they collapsed on the ground. And then by the time that the paramedics got to them, they had already passed away. So these sudden deaths, which are common in athletes, what causes it? In most cases, this is a congenital condition. It's there by birth. And this is something called congenital cardiomegaly or congenital myopathy, cardiac myopathy. They, these people are born with enlarged hearts, hearts which are already much larger than normal, okay? Which means the heart is so thick that when they start exercising or um, in, engaging in any physical activity, uh, it can, the thickness of the heart prevents more blood from being pumped out. It's too thick for it, too big for its own good, cardiomegaly, okay? And so that can lead to sudden cardiac death, as you can see, okay? So congenital heart defects, uh, if you have high blood pressure, you are more likely to drop dead like this because high blood pressure, again, causes your heart to become thicker, larger, cardiomegaly, as you can see, okay? Sometimes we have signs and symptoms like shortness of breath, dizziness, arrhythmias, which are disturbance with the cardiac rhythm and those kinds of things. Sometimes we have no symptoms. And unfortunately, the only time you find out that you have heart disease is when you've already passed away and someone is doing an autopsy on you and then they see that your heart was much larger than normal, okay? So, but if you got an x-ray for whatever reason, that might show the doctor that you have an enlarged heart or an echocardiogram, which again, uh, is like an ultrasound of the heart, okay? So here we are looking at uh, the heart sounds, okay? And classically, they are called the S1 and S2 sounds or the lub-dub sounds, as you hear, uh, as you see on this slide, okay? And so you pick up these heart sounds, again, by means of your auscultation, stethoscope. So when you take the instrument, and you put it at your heart, at the different valves, at your tricuspid valve, then the bicuspid valve, then the semilunar valves, and you hear these lub dub, lub dub sounds. The first sound is S1, and the second sound is S2. The question is, what causes these sounds in the first place? Uh, the heart sounds. So the first heart sound, or the S1, is actually your AV valves closing, not opening, but closing back. So your AV valves, your tricuspid and your bicuspid valves closing. S2, or the dub sound, the second sound is caused by your semilunar valves closing, your aortic and your pulmonic. 
uh, some are lunar valves closing, okay? So that's what they are. Sometimes you might also have additional heart sounds in addition to S1 and S2. So more than lubbed up, you can have a third sound as well. And this, most of them are basically just harmless, benign. They don't mean anything. Maybe it's like some anomaly in your heart. It's shaped a different way. It doesn't cause any signs and symptoms. Uh, but in some cases, um, if, especially if it's something which just appeared recently and is associated with signs and symptoms like dizziness or nausea and vomiting or passing out, then it could mean something more serious like valvular insufficiency or, or valvular stenosis. And we'll talk about what each of th these mean. So what is valvular regurgitation or valvular insufficiency? That means your valves, your tricuspid or and bicuspid valves or your semilunar valves are not closing properly, right? So what's the pro problem here if they're not closing properly? Think of it. So the atria contracted and the blood moved down into the ventricle, valves have closed or they should have closed. Now when the ventricle contracts, the valves open back up and the blood goes back up into the upper atrium. Instead of going into your pulmonary trunk or into your aorta, the blood is being pumped back up into the right atrium. So it's, it's like a ping pong game, right atrium, left atrium, ventricle, back to the right atrium, back to the right ventricle. The blood is not getting anywhere. So that's what valvular insufficiency or valvular regurgitation do, all right? And it's because of your uh, valvular failure, either your tricuspid or your uh, semilunar valves, okay? Uh, and so the heart fails eventually. It's a lot of strain on the heart. The blood is it, unable to pump the blood out because it just keeps pumping within itself, right? And so, um, so you know how they say that someone was born with a hole in the heart? So sometimes a hole in the heart all it's referring to is uh, faulty valves like these, hole in the heart. It can, it can make, uh, mean a couple of things. It can, make, uh, it, it can, it can mean uh, valvular problems, right? Valvular failure. Uh, or sometimes it can also mean a patent foramen ovale or PFO, patent foramen ovale, okay? Which means what? Remember the little hole we were talking about, the window that connects the right atrium and the left atrium in your fetal life, which should have closed by the, at the moment that you were born and you took your first breath? Well, sometimes, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. The, the foramen ovale really doesn't close, all right? And so, even though you're born, uh, you're outside of your mother's uterus now, and the placenta and the umbilical cord have been cut, and your own lungs should be functional, but they're still mixing on the right and left side of the heart. Uh, and so that again, is a hole in the heart. The foramen ovale has not closed properly. Signs and symptoms, the baby is listless, the baby's uh, failing to thrive, not eating properly, you know, throwing up, uh, and is an obvious respiratory distress, flaring of the nostrils, the baby's trying to breathe and cannot breathe properly, starting blue, cyanosis. Uh, you see these kinds of signs and symptoms in patent foramen ovale. All right then, so what is valvular stenosis? That simply means that the valves are too tight. So when the atria contract and they try to push blood down through the, through the valves, the valves are so tight that barely any blood trickles through. So that puts a lot of strain on your atria because they have to contract double heart just to push the blood down into the ventricles, okay? Eventually heart failure is what you're gonna see here again. So st valvular stenosis. How do you fix either of these, insufficiency or stenosis? Surgery, you have to fix the valves uh, by surgical means, okay? Sometimes you have to put in like artificial valves uh, to make sure that these things don't happen, okay? Right, so in this picture, you are looking at the heart and uh, the valves of, obviously you can see the four valves in this transverse section and a lot of fibrous tissue. This is all collagen uh, and connective tissue, right? A lot of gristle that you have in the heart here. Uh, and so how the heart contracts is it's, it starts contracting from the apex. The apex contracts first and then this contraction goes upwards to the base of the heart. So it starts contracting from up down, from up to down, right? From, from, from the apex all the way up to the base. All right, so next up, we are looking at the cardiac muscle and what does it look like under the microscope and in gross appearance as well. So first up again, cardiac muscle is branched and you can see this branching pattern here quite clearly in this picture, right? Uh, okay. And what else are you seeing? You're seeing a bunch of mitochondria. Mitochondria all over the place because mitochondria are the power generators of the cell. 
Uh, they give you ATP energy, and that's what the heart needs the most because it keeps pumping more than any other muscle, right? So lots of mitochondria. These are some nuclei. You see nucleus as well. These are your intercalated discs, okay? Those transverse lines that you're seeing the cracks. Intercalated discs will only be found in cardiac muscle, nowhere else. What makes an intercalated disc? Here, these two things. Uh, desmosomes and gap junctions. So these are gap junctions. Remember what gap junctions were? They allow for the electrical current to pass fast and easily and in a co coordinated way from one heart cell to the other heart cell fast. Because again, the heart needs to work as a syncytium, which means as a single unit. It needs to, if it were contracting at different times, different parts of the heart, that's an arrhythmia, okay? That won't be able to pump the blood properly, you'll die. So therefore, in order for your heart to beat together as a unit, as a syncytium, uh, you need these intercalated discs, the gap junctions, which allow for the electrical charge to pass easily from place to place. Desmosomes, these are kind of like Velcro. You know how you have Velcro on your jacket, your shoes, and you can, you can take it up and then stick it back up. So desmosomes are like Velcro-like connective tissue that kind of pulls the heart muscles together, but not so tightly together that no electrical current can pass, okay? So that's what the intercalated discs are made up of. So you can see all of those structures here in this picture. You also see what are called T-tubules for transverse tubules here, all right? So what are these transverse tubules for? The T-tubules, um, the transverse tubules are for taking calcium ions and diffusing them all the way throughout the cardiac muscle. Remember, to contract your heart needs calcium ions. And the transverse tubules, their job is to take these calcium ions and diffuse them far and wide all across your cardiac muscle, okay? All right, so, so sarcolemma, that's the membrane that surrounds the heart muscle here. That's the membrane, right? Transverse tubules there in green. Uh, they carry calcium ions. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, again, it, this is the, uh, the jelly-like fluid, the endoplasmic reticulum found within the cardiac muscle. Then here's the nucleus. You see a bunch of mitochondria again here. Here are your muscle fibers called myofibrils that make up the heart muscle, okay? Uh, and, and, and the intercalated discs. Those are important for the identification, the ID of cardiac muscle. Look for these intercalated discs. There, 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 these intercalated discs. And remember what makes intercalated discs? Desmosomes and gap junctions, all right? So cardiac muscle is metabolically the most active muscle. It keeps pumping right throughout. So it needs a very good blood supply, uh, lots of mitochondria, and a special type of hemoglobin called myoglobin. Myo means muscle. So myoglobin is a specialized type of hemoglobin that can carry e even more oxygen than typical hemoglobin. And it's stored in your muscles, including your cardiac muscle. And an enzyme called creatine kinase, right? What does this enzyme do? Creatine kinase, it generates extra ATP that are needed to power your heart. Creatine kinase. The same creatine that bodybuilders take. Uh, creatine is a metabolite of amino acids. It's a breakdown product of amino acids. Uh, and what it does is it gives an extra phosphate to your ADP to make more ATP. And ATP is your body's muscle fuel, right? It powers your muscular, uh, muscular functions. So the thing about your heart is it can use all kinds of nutrients. It can feast on glucose, which everything else does. It can also use fatty acids, lactic acid, even amino acids and ketone bodies. Even if you're in a diabetic ketoacidosis, still your heart can even eat up ketone. So your body has designed your heart to just keep going at any cost. It can eat up everything. Even lactic acid, which is generated when you're having a heart attack, right? Or when you get cramps on your muscle, when your muscles have been stressed beyond their maximal ability, that's when you start developing, uh, making lactic acid and your heart can even eat that just to keep going, okay? But most of the heart relies on aerobic metabolism. It uses oxygen to keep going. So if you're low on oxygen, that's trouble for the heart. That's what happens when you get a heart attack. You're working out or exercising, running or something, or you get a shock, and all of a sudden you develop ischemia. Ischemia is a lack of uh, oxygen or blood supply to your muscle, right? So when you get ischemia in the heart, that's called angina, A-N-G-I-N-A, angina. Uh, pain, chest pain because of uh, an interference with blood supply to the heart. Okay, which side of the heart is more visible on the anterior view of the heart? The left side, 
is more visible. On the posterior view, the right side of the heart. Which of the great vessels are more visible from the anterior view? Which ones were those? Uh, the aorta, right, and the pulmonary trunk. From the posterior view, the pulmonary veins, and the superior and inferior vena cava, uh, and the coronary sinus. They were all more visible, posterior view. What are the three primary sulci of the heart? The anterior interventricular sulcus, the posterior interventricular sulcus, and the coronary sulcus, okay, those cracks through which the blood vessels were running. What structures are within these superficial grooves of the heart? Okay, so what runs through the anterior interventricular sulcus? The anterior interventricular artery. What runs through the posterior interventricular sulcus? The posterior interventricular artery. What runs through the coronary uh, uh, sulcus? The coronary arteries and the coronary sinus. What are the layers of the heart in order that a scalpel would pass through during dissection? So the outermost layer is the fibrous pericardium, then the parietal layer of the serous pericardium, then the pericardial cavity itself filled up with pericardial fluid, then the visceral layer of the uh, serous pericardium, okay? Or epicardium, myocardium, endocardium, okay? What is the structure that separates the two ventricles, the interventricular septum, a flap, thick flap of muscle? What is the superficial landmark that ident identifies the location of this structure? Uh, the st the interventricular artery would be running through this interventricular septum. How are the papillary muscles tendinous cords or cordia tendine and AV valves posi positioned relative to one another? Okay, so here's the AV valve. These threads attached to the AV valves are called the tendinous cords or the cordia tendine, and the other end of the cordia tendine are attached to the papillary muscles. So valve, papillary muscle, and the cordia tendine attached to both in the middle. What are the functions of the cordia tendine and papillary muscles to prevent your valves from opening back up into the atria, to prevent them, just to hold them here, right? Only one way opening, not going all the way back up. Um, which function of the fibrous skeleton allows the atria to contract separately from the ventricles? So um, the electrical current takes uh, some amount of time to pass from the top atria uh, to the bottom ventricles. So the atria contract just a fraction of a second before the ventricles do, which is extremely important. Imagine what, hap what would happen if the atria and the ventricles were contracting at the same time. The blood would just, the heart would burst. The blood would just not go anywhere. So it will just increase pressure. But in order for uh, the blood to be pushed out of the heart, it's very important that the atria would contract just a fraction of a second before the lower ventricles do. Which features of cardiac muscles support aerobic cellular respiration. They have plenty of mitochondria, they have lots of myoglobin, they have lots of creatine kinase. All of them ensure that there's enough oxygen supply and uh, energy release going on in your cardiac muscle. All right, so next up we are looking at the coronary circulation, the blood vessels that supply blood to the heart itself. Remember, the heart is a self-sustaining chamber. Not only does it supply blood to the rest of the body, it also supplies blood to itself. All right, so what are they? Let's take a look here. So uh, first up, uh, these coronary arteries which supply the heart muscle itself, they, they are branches of your aorta. Here's the aorta. So the right coronary artery branches are from the aorta as does the left coronary artery. So let's look at the left coronary artery first. The left coronary artery divides into the circumflex artery, which goes here, and then the anterior interventricular artery. That one is important. That's the widow maker or the LAD for left anterior descending artery. This one goes all the way down through the anterior interventricular sulcus to your apex. It supplies most of your left ventricle, that one, right? So these two are the branches of your left coronary artery. Okay, what about the right one? <coughs> Excuse me. So if you look at the right coronary artery, that uh, divides into these two branches, the posterior interventricular artery that goes to the back to supply the posterior side of the heart, and you can see it here in this outline, right? And then the right marginal artery, which is here. The right marginal artery supplies your right ventricle, as you can see. So the two branches of the right coronary artery and the two branches of the left coronary artery here. Okay, so uh, remember what I said about the coronary arteries. They are functional end arteries. They are dead ends, right? So if uh, there's a blockage in one, usually there's not enough alternative routes for blood to get to the rest of your heart. So you have to keep your arteries in good shape, okay? 
All right, so, so how about the veins? So these are the veins that drain blood back from the heart and into the right atrium again for oxygenation. Great cardiac vein, which is in the anterior interventricular sulcus, right next to where? Right next to your anterior interventricular artery, right? Then the middle cardiac vein, which is in the posterior interventricular sulcus, the small cardiac vein, which sits right next to your right marginal artery, and the coronary sinus, which is on the posterior side of your coronary sulcus, okay? Here, coronary sinus, it's at the back. Great cardiac vein right next to the, uh, in the anterior interventricular sulcus. Small cardiac vein uh, in, 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 in the uh, sulcus here. And then the middle cardiac vein right next to your uh, marginal artery, the right marginal artery. You can see that in the picture. All right, so some cardiac issues that we are looking at here. Angina pectoris and myocardial infarction. What is angina pectoris? Pain in your chest. Mostly it's caused because of lack of blood supply to the heart, because one of the coronary arteries are blocked. And what are some of the common causes for coronary artery disease? High cholesterol, right, and smoking. So coronary artery disease or blockages in, in your coronary blood vessels, some of the major risk factors are smoking and increased cholesterol, high cholesterol, okay? Too much fat, smoking, um, and also blood clots. If you have blood clotting disorders, they also increase your risk for having heart attacks like that, right? Even COVID-19 infections, as we mentioned, can cause blood clots. So what they do is they cause your coronary blood vessels to block, you get cardiac pain. Where do you feel this uh, chest pain? Classically left side of the chest and it radiates, it moves to your, up to your left side of the neck, sometimes to your left upper jaw, also all the way down to your left arm. Okay, so this is a radiating type of pain. And it's uh, pretty bad, right? So to give you, just to give you some idea of how bad uh, a heart attack or myocardial infarction pain or angina pectoris is, all of us have gotten Charlie horse at one point or the other. So think of the worst Charlie horse you got in your calf muscles. Take the same pain and concentrate all of that pain here in a ball of muscle about the size of your left fist and multiply it by 50. So you can imagine how painful that would be and how scary. And here's the deal, the more scared and more uh, under pain that you are, the harder the heart beats, the harder it beats, the lower it gets on oxygen and the pain gets worsened. So this is like a vicious cycle. It's a positive feedback cycle. The heart gets weaker and weaker because it's trying to beat that much more hard. So you need immediate uh, calls to 911 and immediate medical attention here for someone who's having a heart attack, okay? And so, uh, how would you treat someone with, who's having an active heart attack? Clot busting drugs. You have to give them clot busters to thin the heart out. So things like TPA, uh, a drug for TPA, that stands for tissue plasminogen activator. Uh, this is a blood thinner, right? Aspirin, you have to keep them on aspirin therapy, all right? Heparin, heparin is another uh, anticoagulant, uh, which is IV or Per orum through the mouth, orally you can give them warfarin or coumadin, okay? These are all blood thinners. You can also give them medications like Plavix. What Plavix does is it is a platelet uh, aggregation inhibitor, which means it prevents your platelets from sticking together to form a blood clot, okay? So the blood can flow easily to the heart. So uh, clot busting drugs is basically your main uh, strategy here. Try to resume the blood flow to the heart. That's what you're looking at here, okay? And give them painkillers. Obviously, they need strong painkillers, narcotics sometimes, morphine derivatives because the pain is so severe and you want to prevent that because the more in pain they are, the harder the heart will try to beat here, all right? Oxygen supplementation. You have to put oxygen cannula in many cases. Uh, so what areas of the heart are deprived of blood when there's a blockage in the posterior to ventricular artery? So the posterior side of the heart, which would be your right atrium and your right ventricle mostly, okay? What is the function of the coronary sinus? To collect blood from all of your coronary veins and drain this blood back into your right atrium for oxygenation, okay? All right, so next up here, we are looking at the heart as a pacemaker. What does that mean? The heart is an electrical battery in its, in its own right. It's your body's own uh, pacemaker, 
it, it generates its own electrical rhythm. It starts beating when you are still um, in your fourth week of development inside of the uterus, and it'll keep beating till the end of life. So how does this electrical activity start? It starts with this little dime-sized area uh, called the sinoatrial node or the SA node, which is found in the superior, superior corner of your right atrium, right there. This is where the electricity is generated, the electrical impulse. Then it spreads out uh, to this other little area called the AV or the atrioventricular node, which is right above the, your atrioventricular valve, AV node. So the electrical current spreads from here and it's picked up by the AV node. Then the AV nodes uh, sends the electrical current down here through what is called the AV bundle, atrioventricular bundle, or also called bundle of his, H-I-S, all right? And then this bundle of his actually uh, separates out into these two right and left bundles, right bundle and left bundle, right? And so these nerves then go and then they rise back up again and then they terminate into these little Purkin J fibers, these. So this is the direction of your heartbeat, literally. The electrical current starts from here, then picked up here, then goes all the way here, bundle of his, and then to the Purkin J fibers, all right? So this is a constant electrical uh, grid, electrical circuit that you have established here. So what determines your heart rate? It's not the heart itself uh, necessarily, it's your brain stem. And uh, the cardiac center is located in the part of your brain stem called the medulla oblongata, which is the inferior most part of your brain stem, okay? So that has both cardioacceleratory and cardioinhibitory centers. What do they do? Uh, the cardioacceleratory centers speed up the heart, cause tachycardia, and the cardioinhibitory centers slow down the heart, right? They cause bradycardia. So how do they speed up the heart? By using sympathetic nerves. Remember, sympathetic nerves are your body's fight or flight mechanism, the adrenaline nerves, right? Uh, and the parasympathetic nerves are the rest and digest, the peaceful nerves. Uh, so the chief peaceful parasympathetic nerve that slows down the heart is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is nerve number 10. All right, so there you go. So the parasympathetic innervation, P for parasympathetic, P for peaceful, right? It decreases heart rate. So that is your vagus nerve, which is nerve number 10. The sympathetic nerve uh, innervation comes from your cardioacceleratory center of the medulla oblongata, and it comes from the neurons found between your T1 and T5 segments of the spinal cord, the first thoracic and the fifth thoracic segments of the spinal cord. And these ones speed up the heart rate, make it more powerful, stronger, okay? So here in this picture, you can see the peaceful parasympathetic innervation, mainly your vagus nerve, car, uh, nerve number 10, which is slowing down the heart, and then the sympathetic nerve in blue or purple, rather on the other hand side, coming from your medulla oblongata of the brain. And these ones, they speed up the heart, okay? So why is the SA node referred to as the pacemaker? Because that is what starts the electrical impulse in the heart. It comes from the sinoatrial node in your right atrium. Which autonomic division is associated with the cardioacceleratory center in the brainstem? The sympathetic nervous system. How does it affect heart activity? It makes it stronger and it increases the heart rate. It causes tachycardia. All right, so here again in this picture, and we will stop with this slide here. We are halfway through. Uh, here's your SA node, right? This is what starts the cardiac contraction. So the initiation of your electrical impulse starts at the SA node, and then it will be carried on to your AV node, the atrioventricular node here, then down the uh, bundle of his, then into the right and left bundles here, and then into the Purkinje fibers, all right? So next week, we're gonna talk about how does this electrical impulse start in the SA node, goes down to the AV node, and then uh, what happens from that point onwards, all right, the electrical activity of the heart. Okay, so here we are, done with uh, half of chapter, chapter 19. Um, so I'm gonna share the notes with you, there's only, a handful of them to, today, okay? So we'll continue with those uh, next time. Um, and I will be uploading the lecture as well. Uh, so keep checking your emails, all the study guides and other assignments being sent out. Stay safe, stay warm, uh, take care of yourselves, especially this week, record-breaking cold temperatures. Uh, any questions, concerns, feedback, you have my suggestions, you have my email address, please feel free to email me and uh, have a wonderful and safe week ahead of you. All right. Take care of you. Bye-bye.